Good evening, everybody. It is October 21st, 2020. Uh, my good friend John Clausen suggested that uh, I kind of give it a date stamp at the beginning of each uh, Bible study for those of you who are, you know, sometime in the future, if anyone gets really bored and they start um, going back in time to try to catch up with where I've been in Mark or something, it makes it easier to find your spot if you uh, have the date. So that's such a good idea. I can't believe my wife didn't think of that sooner. Um, so I put the date in the title also, as you probably see, just to uh, make it even that much easier. So I was thinking this week about how uh, perhaps I have gotten a little too comfortable in doing these live streams. When the first time I did a live stream, I felt like I was on a first date or something, or it was like my first time uh, speaking in front of a crowd just because I was so uh, out of my element. And then last week I made sure that everybody got a shot up my nose so that you could see if uh, I had anything up there. Maybe got a little too comfortable with that, but uh, at least I'm not nervous anymore, right? So, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, I got a letter in the mail from Hank Muskalkis, our uh, favorite sailor at the moment. You, you may have a, a more favorite sailor than that, but he's my favorite sailor. Uh, he is uh, obviously out of quarantine. I'm sure you guys have heard that, but um, he's doing great. He said that there's something like half of his um, division, or I can't remember the title or the name of the uh, you know the unit that he's in, whatever that is, is either Christian or Catholic, and um, he's really enjoying. Um, not necessarily boot camp, but that he is sure that God is uh, using him there, that God had him there uh, for a reason, and God is directing his path. So that's all great to hear. He says, the, actually, he said the only hard part about uh, basic training at this point is that he doesn't get enough sleep. Everything else is easy. So um, anyway, it was great to hear from him, um, and I will keep updating you with him as I get letters, and I'm sure that, you know, his mom and dad do also, um, and big church, so, anyway, I enjoyed that, I like hearing from him, and, uh, yeah, that's it, let's pray, Lord, we, uh, are grateful for this technology, that we can, uh, still gather in your name, even if, uh, it has to be for my front porch, um, thank you for, uh, those who are listening in, um, Lord, I ask that you would bless all of us, that we would um, have humble hearts, that we would learn from you today, and that you would um, help us to apply your word to our lives. And Lord, pray that you'd bless Hank and help him to finish well through basic training and uh, continue to use him for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, last week we finished uh, Mark... 6, 13 is where we ended up, um, and Jesus had sent his apostles out on their first missionary journey, sort of um, a missionary trip on training wheels, because he was still around, and they were able to come back to him and uh, get debriefed after that and spend more time with Jesus, but it, it ended with them actually going out and doing that, so this is uh, where we finished last week, 6, verse 12 and 13, it says, So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent, and they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. So now today, we are going to sort of pick up in the middle of that story where um, the disciples are out on their mission, but we get this story about uh, Herod, and John the Baptist, and John the Baptist being executed by Herod. Um, and after that, the disciples are going to come back from their mission, and we're going to see how that goes. Um, but I just wanted to make sure everyone was clear that this story that we're about to read with Herod and 
uh, John the Baptist sort of is sandwiched in the middle of the disciples going out on their mission. So we're going to pick up in Mark 6, verse 14, and it says, King Herod heard of it, that is the disciples on their mission and all that they were doing. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But Herod, when he heard it, he said, John, whom I behead, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him wanted to put him to death, but she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And he heard him, when he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. So this story is a little bit um, confusing to me for a number of reasons. I mean, for one, you've got a guy named Herod who is married to a woman named Herodias, and... Uh, he's that's actually his brother's wife but they're married um and there's also several herods in the bible story already in the gospel there was the original herod who was in charge when jesus was born and he was the one who sent out the order to kill all the babies to try to stop the king of the jews from growing up um so that is the original herod and um, he died, uh, and this Herod that we have here is um, that original Herod's son, um, and that's this guy that we're reading about tonight is the same one who kind of makes a guest appearance on the night that Jesus died um, when we get there. So the second thing that is a little confusing about this is just the, the sort of layered timeline. Um, like I said last week, we ended up with the disciples going off on their mission and preaching the gospel and casting out demons. And this section begins with Herod hearing about um, Jesus and the disciples and everything like that. And he confused what Jesus was doing and who Jesus was with a resurrected John the Baptist. And then we kind of get this insight that apparently a lot of people were confused about who Jesus was. Some people said he was Elijah. Some people thought that... Um, he was another uh, Old Testament prophet or someone like the, te the Old Testament prophets. Um, but Herod, of course, is convinced that Jesus is John the Baptist. So then we kind of get the rest of the story is like a flashback of what happened to John the Baptist after he baptized Jesus. So at some point, this guy, Herod, is uh, in charge. He's got a lot of power. He can do what he wants and he decides what he wants to do is marry his brother's wife. Uh, that sounds like trouble to me. And John thought so also. John the Baptist never won to back down from pointing out sin when he saw it. Said, hey, that's sin. You shouldn't do that. That's his governor. I mean, that's the thing that he should be doing as a, a spiritual leader in that country. He should be calling out the leaders. So he does. And... Uh, this story makes it clear that Herodias, the woman involved, did not like what John the Baptist was saying, so she pressured Herod. Herod arrested John, although it didn't seem like he really cared all that much. You gotta have no shame to, to do that kind of anything anyway. He probably knew a little bit about John the Baptist already because he was a major figure in his region and probably knew that John the Baptist was going to criticize him, but Hey, my wife doesn't like it, so let's put him in jail. So while John was in jail, um, Herod would frequently have John brought out to him so that he could hear what John the Baptist had to say. Um, it says that he heard John gladly. He considered him a holy and a righteous man. But everything about John the Baptist Herod. Now, where it says that Herod uh, heard him gladly, that he... Um, feared John or feared to do anything to him, 
considered him righteous and everything else. I don't think that for a moment Herod ever believed anything that John the Baptist said to him. Uh, he certainly never acted on it. I, I think he may have thought John was holy without ever really understanding what holiness and righteousness really were. I mean, all of it kind of reminds me of the kind of person that uh, says that they're they're spiritual, but they're not religious. And you find out a little while later on that they are religious. They just worship trees and rocks and whatever else their fancy takes them. I, and I don't think that John or that Herod was really all that spiritual. Honestly, I think that he liked entertainment and spirituality just considering the things that john the baptist said to him he liked being perplexed by those things and so he heard him gladly he would bring john the baptist out of jail to hear what he had to say because it was fun for him to think about meanwhile his wife rodius um, is holding a grudge against john uh, she was not entertained by the things that he said and so she was constantly watching for an opportunity to get John killed. So, of course, as you know the story, the situation came up immediately. Well, immediately for us. right? Okay, so here we are in verse uh, 21. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, What should I ask? For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry because of his oaths. But because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. And he went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So Herod has this big party for himself and his friends on his birthday. <coughs> Excuse me. His niece, who was also his stepdaughter, uh, came and danced for the group, and Herod was pleased. He liked entertainment. And he promised to give her a reward for her performance, sort of, uh, I don't know, if they believed in tipping at that point, or if it was just sort of a show for his friends so that they would see how benevolent he was, or whatever it was. Uh, of course, um, the girl went and asked her mom what she should ask for because here's Herod basically just wrote her a blank check. Hey, what do you want? Just name it and you can have it. Uh, he didn't mean the whole half my kingdom thing literally. But um, um, Herodias immediately saw that she had trapped Herod. Herod uh, had taken an oath. There was his friends and other important people around, and he would be publicly embarrassed if he went back on his word. No one would believe him anymore, especially for the sake of some Jewish holy guy. So they cut Jed, they cut John's head off, and they brought it on a platter. I have always kind of imagined this little girl. Well, we don't know how old she was. It doesn't really say. But it does use the same word for little girl as the uh, the twelve year old girl that Jesus rose, raised from the dead. Um, so I always kind of imagine this little girl who is uh, so dumbstruck by the idea of like I can ask for anything. What should I ask for? And she asks her mom for advice, and when she finally gets what she asks for, it's his head on a platter, and she thinks I could have had anything. I could have had a pony, I could have had a city, and I've got this decapitated head, and so she goes and takes it to her mom. Um, and of course, you know, John's disciples come and take care of the rest of his body. But the interesting thing to me 
about this story, especially here where it's placed in the middle of the disciples or the apostles going out on their mission, is that, uh, okay, I'm going to be frank here. There doesn't seem to be any sort of lesson or moral to the story. I, I try to always read the Bible with the idea of what should I do about this? Or should I change the way I live or the way that I think about things because of what was just said? And I'm not sure really what I should think about this or what I should do with the information I just got about John the Baptist and Herod and decapitation and everything else. And even when I read through commentators, commentaries, guys who are smarter than me, who have written about the Gospel of Mark, when you read what they have to say about this story, all of them kind of just land on, uh, see, this is wickedness, and this is how bad things get when you allow wickedness to run rampant. And that's kind of it. There's not really a, a personal application. Um, but I think that there is a an intention for this story. I think that there is a reason that this was here. Of course there's a reason for, for this, right? I mean, would God waste his time by including this story? But I think the reason it's here, and this is just my idea, is that uh, Mark, the author, is signaling to us, the audience, that there is a transition now in the way that Jesus' ministry is going to work. Um, John the Baptist is not on the scene anymore. There's no uh, distraction for the people who are looking to repent or looking to uh, hear about God. There's only one guy that they're going to go to now. Because there, obviously there was some kind of distraction because John the Baptist who was supposed to point people to follow Jesus, still has disciples. So now he's off the scene, and um, Jesus' ministry is is sort of focusing now. He was kind of mainly ministering to the crowds uh, in all of the last few chapters that we've been looking at. It's, it's mostly Jesus interacting with the crowds, and now he is focusing more in on the training of the disciples. That's how I read it, right? He's got um, this lesson of like hands-on ministry that he's just sent his apostles out on. Um, and we're going to see the sort of debriefing for that immediately after we finish the story. So to me, that's my read on it. It's a transition period. And that death of John the Baptist and how that all went down is sort of a, a signal to us as the reader of pay attention to how Jesus operates now and, and the new way that he's going to do things. And of course, as a, as it is a transition period, uh, we know how that is when we're in transition, there's going to be conflict. Things don't go as we planned. And that's what we see happening here as we pick up in John chapter, Mark chapter six, verse 30 it says the apostles a turn, returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So the first thing that I noticed when I was reading this is that Jesus considers going off to a desolate place to be restful. I like that. Uh, that's, you know, he, he notices that the disciples are tired. He knows He's very familiar with the kind of work that they've been doing, and he knows that they need a break. They don't book a nice hotel in Jerusalem or Capernaum or wherever it was they were. He says, hey, wherever people are, we're going to head the opposite direction. Let's just get out of here. You know, you can see that Jesus is home base wherever he was, and they come back, the head come back to him. There's a lot of people coming and going. The disciples couldn't even take a minute to eat. And he says, hey, let's, let's get out of here for a minute. It's important to take care of yourself when you're ministering to other people. And um, I'm not talking about myself here like as a, a 
pastor of a church is important for pastors to go on retreats or whatever. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about uh, all of us are servants of God. All of us are supposed to be those who serve other people. We're supposed to be ministering to other people. And it's important for us to get away sometimes, go off into the boondocks. Don't have to go very far around here, right? And rest. Get a little time to like clear your head and you know, think. And a lot of times that can't happen concurrently, meaning you can't serve and get rest at the same time. So it has to happen consecutively, meaning you work now and then you have rest later on. Jesus deemed this to be something that was so necessary that he gathered the disciples, got them on a boat, and they tried to take off. Um, his recommendation to them was based um, completely on his, on his compassion. And we're going to see that sort of uh, layer up here as we read the stories, his compassion. Uh, he knew what it was like to travel around and teach and heal people, and he knew when they needed rest. But, of course, as we just saw, Jesus' plan was disrupted. Now, it seems a little strange to me that Jesus, the Son of God, made a plan, expressed that plan, told his disciples, hey, this is what we're going to go do. This is my will. And that this crowd of people was able to somehow counteract that. Is that like humanity somehow breaking the will of God? I, I don't know. I might be making too much of a little thing because it's more important really to see, I don't know, that's just my brain went there. Um, it's more important to see how Jesus reacted to this um, disruption of his plan. He could have very easily sent the crowd away. We've seen him do that before. He could have got in the boat and just sailed away somewhere further, right? I mean, the Sea of Galilee is not big enough that you can run around it. He probably just, you know, they were here and they just traveled along the shore a little bit to the, the spot that looked good and that's where everybody found them. They could have just gone across the lake to the different, the other side of, of the Sea of Galilee, but they didn't. Jesus, um, when he saw them, he had compassion on them and he, he, knew or he saw that they were like sheep without a shepherd. Now, I don't know much about sheep, never kept livestock of any kind, uh, but we did once upon a time have a small herd of uh, sheep and goats out here to try to help uh, control the brush around here. Didn't work too well just because of... Um, the guy that had the herd kind of overcommitted himself. Anyway, um, one thing that was necessary for the sheep when they were out here is that they came with a guard dog, and that was, like, not negotiable. If I had dogs, they were going to have to be put away somewhere because their dog was going to be here no matter what. Uh, sheep are pretty defenseless. Um, they need protection. And they also, a, a shepherd also provides leadership. They can lead a flock um, out to the field where they're going to find food to eat. He can move them from one field to the next field where they're going to find a new source of food to eat. Uh, he can lead them back to the barn where they can sleep safely. Uh, that's the leadership that a, a shepherd provides. And Jesus saw these people and they were uh, without leadership. They were without protection and he had compassion on them. <coughs> Excuse me. The compassion that Jesus has for this crowd sort of overrules the compassion that he had for his apostles. This kind of reminds me of the uh, the parable of the lost sheep, which begins, we're not going to read all of it, but it begins in uh, Luke chapter uh, 15, verse 4. It says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. So in this case, the uh, the apostles were the 99. Um, they were tired, but they were safe. The crowd was lost. And so even though 
it was not his will that the crowd followed them. Uh, even though uh, he wanted his apostles to get the rest that they needed, he showed, he chose to show love and compassion to the crowd. And he did that by teaching them. So, um, you know, they probably came out for a different reason. They probably were not chasing Jesus around so that he could um, teach them another lecture or another sermon. But Jesus recognized that their greatest need was not uh, hunger or sickness, uh, but that they were without shepherding. So that's what he did. He, he reacted with compassion on them and he taught them. Verse 35. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy two hundred denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, Five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were five thousand men. So Jesus, Jesus' compassion on the crowds uh, overruled or sort of, uh, how do I say this? Uh, he had to put his, his apostles, his compassion on the apostles on the back burner, right? But that didn't completely negate his, his intention or his um, attention for his uh, disciples. Remember that they're in this new phase of ministry where they're not just watching Jesus do things for this big crowd, but they have hands-on experience now. And Jesus is sort of um, bringing them out further and closer to the front because there's going to come a day, probably not too far from now, when they're going to be doing all of this work on their own. So... Um, the first thing that he's doing as he's training his disciples is that he's bringing his disciples, his apostles, into his compassion. He's making them a part of his compassion on the crowd. So when they come to Jesus and say, hey, look, these people uh, need to go away. They're, they're hungry. It's late. We're out in the middle of nowhere. Jesus says, no, you feed them. You feed them. Now, this is an impossible task that Jesus just gave his disciples. Um, he gave them a job that, frankly, they could not do. It was impossible for them. Uh, they even sort of sarcastically asked him, like, hey, should we go into town and spend 200 denarii to buy food for all of these people? As if anyone, like, there's a, a Walmart in town or a, a Costco where they're going to find enough food to feed 5,000 people. Uh, and even if they could find such a place, they don't have 200 denarii. Um, that's a huge sum of money. Uh, but I, I've kind of felt that way, that, that the disciples were feeling. Uh, I think I've felt a little bit like that in every single job that God has ever given me, that, uh, hey, you've just asked me to do something that is beyond my ability. I, I think that God, you know me pretty well, and you know that what you just asked me to do is not something that is covered by my abilities and strengths. Um, I kind of feel like that every time I sit down to teach or stand up to teach or sit down to study and, and prepare to teach. I think, I think everyone should be a little overwhelmed um, anytime they are teaching the Bible. Honestly, I think that's the right attitude for me, at least, because I know that I am a finite and completely fallible human being. I make mistakes all the time. And here we're taking God's word, which is at a minimum 2,000 years old, and it's at the same time the eternal living word of the infinite God. 
and I'm going to explain it to people. <laughs> and I'm going to take it upon myself to tell you what you should do with the Word of God. Um, that's scary. That is uh, daunting. And I hope I never feel any other way about the Word of God, personally. Um, so, I think that the disciples felt something like that. As Jesus gives them this job, uh, maybe it wasn't so like, spiritually um, overwhelming, but it was certainly physically impossible. Uh, but Jesus is training them. So we asked the, he asked them, what are the supplies that you have? Like, how much food do you guys have? He takes their eyes off of the obstacles and he gets them to take stock of what they do have. So they come up with five loaves of bread and two fish. Now, the Gospel of John tells us that it was actually some little boy who supplied this food. It was, you know, this, the sack lunch of some kid who was just out there uh, on his own, probably on an adventure, going to go see Jesus that day. So Jesus uses the sack lunch of this little boy, and he uses the hands of, the dis of these disciples who doubted that this was even possible, and he fed 5,000 men. It says 5,000 men, and it's specific there that it was um, the number of men was 5,000, which means that Jesus made sure that no women or kids ate that day. No, it means that uh, there was an uncounted number of other people, women and children, um, who also ate. So it could have been more like eight or 10,000 people. Um, so this was, again, part of the training of the apostles. And I think that the, the reason that Jesus put this in their hands, the reason that he um, asked them, you know, how much do we have? What can we uh, gather together? is because he wanted to make it clear to the apostles what was actually necessary. What was something that was um, absolutely non-negotiable? What do you need to have if you're going to do the work of God? And really, what do you, ha what do you need? Story show us, uh, you have to be surrendered. Just like the little boy had just a tiny amount of food you know, a tiny bit, and he just surrendered it over to God. It wasn't a lot. Um, and it's interesting that it actually is recorded how little we had. It's not like this boy was carrying around enough food for 4,500 men, and God was just going to make up a little bit of the difference. No, this, this meal that the boy was carrying around was like trying to spit on a forest fire. It's worthless. It's pointless to even consider this of like, Oh, how am I going to meet this need? How about this tiny bit of crumbs that this little boy's carrying around? But he surrendered it over to Jesus, and Jesus used it. I, I think it must have been just baffling to the apostles that you know, he just divides it up, a, a sack lunch for one little boy, and he divides it between 12 grown men. It's They're holding in their hands an amount of food that wouldn't even satisfy one of them. And they go and pass it out. And, oh, oh, I have more. here. Here's, Oh, I have more. And each one of those apostles, if you do the math, would have handed out food to over 400 men each, plus the women and children. 400 times. I, I still have more. I, I still have. And they, afterwards, Jesus sends them around to go pick up the scraps. And there's enough scraps that each one of them can pick up a basket of leftovers. So Jesus uses his apostles as an extension of his uh, compassion. Um, he teaches his apostles to be compassionate, and he also taught them um, the lesson of, of humility, of surrender, and of, of faith. Really, I mean, this little boy who was used by God, he wasn't qualified, right? He wasn't certified of with his food handling certificate and he wasn't, you know, trained at that seminar to be a, a anything, right? He's just a little kid out there doing whatever he feels like doing that day. And he's got a sack lunch and, oh yeah, Jesus, you can use me. Sure. And 
the apostles got to kind of stand on the sidelines for that. God can use anybody. So that's a good lesson for me when I sit down to study or I get here to, to teach, uh, to remember, hey, it, it really has uh, nothing to do with me, right? I don't have to supply 99% of the um, effort here. I don't have to uh, be somebody great and wise and uh, a great leader to teach the word of God because I'm just a I'm just a cup and God fills me up and pours me out fills me up and pours me out and that's true for all of us and every aspect of, of what God calls us to do so uh, with that that's our uh, that's our time for the day that's our, our verses for the day we got to the end um, but uh, I just wanted to say thanks again for for joining me thanks for watching um, I saw a lot of people pop up and say hi. Um, hi, Vanessa. Hi, uh, Brandon and Ivy. Miss you guys. Uh, 